morning, everyone, and thank you for having me here. I, I will make a statement on precarity before I go into sharing my thoughts with you. I think what is precarious is the state of nature and its relationship to the state of human nature. I think that's where the problem of precarity uh, uh, will unfold, you know. And I, I want to um, talk to you about materiality because I, if, if, if one zooms out and sees the big picture, I think <coughs> that one of the essential problems of our times is the materiality. Although architecture for me does not lie in its materiality, but in the design of the voids that humans inhabit. So the users are affected by the part we didn't build and the materials that we hold to build those spaces are how and the ways different practices have yet uh, just discussed with us um, the the materiality concerns on one hand the makers of architecture the skills so every human is involved in architecture as a user or as a maker and the makers the number of makers is not to be underestimated you know it begins with material sourcing and all the people whose jobs are related to products with which architecture is made. And the biggest uh, transition there, and why I think materiality has to be rethought, is because of uh, the, anal having the need to analyze post-industrial practice and the, uh, the whole habit that we've created of over-standardization and, on the other hand, being so standard that there's no space for the individual anymore. It's all about specialization and the big supply chain and all of that. And because of that, I think I would like to talk about materiality not as an external aspect that as if the material is good or bad. And, and I'm kind of, I, I find it very, very dangerous to be talking about environmental problems by as if the material itself is good or bad. It's a mud versus concrete. Um, materials all come from the earth. It's how the human interacted with the material and how they sourced it, that's where the energy consumption take place, whether it is done in a small scale or a big scale, etc. I forgot to even show slides. Um, but, uh, so I want to talk uh, to you about materiality, not from the, as if looking at materials external to ourselves, but from the lens of how humans interact with materials and why I think time is the most underutilized resource or rather it's a resource we are all misusing our lifetime on the earth and we are probably the way we use our time is creating the problem rather than the solution so um, I mean if you look at um, pre-industrial architecture we built architecture with any material if there was mud, you use mud. If there's wood, you use wood. If it's a desert, there's no wood, you make domes. Uh, if, if, if there's ice, you use ice. So there shouldn't be a material fetish which, which comes from a global kind of um, almost a sense of boredom sometimes, um, you know. Uh, there is a deep, deep relationship of what you produce and where you produce it. And in former times, luxurious architecture was defined not by the material and its cost, but by how much time humans gave to it, to craft it, to make ingeniously make bigger and bigger spans, taller and taller buildings. It's not the material that changed. The ingenu ingenuity of the human through the making, and we made things and the things made us. I mean, the things we made, made us. So we evolved through, through the constraints we had. So you would have, for housing, you would do it simpler. For temples, you would do it over people's lifetimes, maybe 400 years to build a thing properly. Today, we have a global material culture of the glass tower 
And that, uh, because it comes at a very high cost, not only in money terms, uh, we have created, we have crystallized and deepened the divide in the world through the uh, true affordable issues, affordability issues, and access issues, etc. And you can see that we don't know. We live in cities where there are two, there are two different cities always. And this is no more only a situation of India. You know, it, you can go to Madrid, go to any periphery. You see that the people who got there first, like in New York, they have a different quality of life than the ones who are going to come later. And you will, you will have to pay a whole lot for a very shitty apartment, a bigger percentage of your salary. And, and we don't know which is one is more miserable, the one who has the autonomy and can but then not have a certain standard, or the other one who's paid a, a whole life's savings to have a little hole which he can't distinguish from the other one. You, you don't know, um, you know. So it, it takes away your whole autonomy. So that, that's one thing. And on the other hand, that uh, you know, reinforced cement concrete has become a vernacular material now. And, but there are high energy materials with which those things are made. And um, I, I really want to take it out, environmental discussions, you know, especially when we talk about um, you know, environmental impact of materials, I would really like to shift that from talking about the materials to talking about the non-material aspects of how we engage with it. We only measure what we can measure and all the things you can't measure which are very important are completely left out of the criteria. Instead, uh, and, and then you don't think about if, if, if you're, what are you using it for? Should every park bench be now made of concrete just because it can be made and because it's there? So I think the human scale is going out of the landscape of our habitat, but the human scale is also going out of our processes, out of the decentralized intelligence that everybody has is not, is being completely left out because of us being molded, indoctrinated, in a standardized culture where each person who's intelligent feels that I'm the only one struggling with the so-called system which won't let me. So I also ask myself, what is the point of doing efficiently things that need not be done at all? And a lot of the materiality is because actually somebody, I mean, the whole thing doesn't have to be done. But instead we're saying, use this, how is everybody going to afford this uh, high-tech uh, solar uh, transport method. Walk. If I walk, they, they're not going to call me eco. And if I use a bicycle, it will not be called eco unless it's a high-tech solar something something bike. And then it's suddenly, you know, it's high time we start calling the polluting vehicles a polluting vehicle. Then we don't have to justify that we are non-polluting. Let's not call things out for being sustainable let's say what is not sustainable. So for example, that would be more scientific. You would, when there is a new polluting car launched, you can say we've come up with the next generation of polluting vehicle. Why should we suddenly be, you know, that's the real truth. This is important. If you, for, first of all, if we didn't do half the things we do, we will have a good life. We will be less stressed, we will not take wrong decisions. We won't be frustrated and we don't need to bully other people in workplaces. All of that will be gone and a lot of materials will be saved. I started uh, realizing by looking around that, um, you know, a lot of my um, uh, buildings, uh, you know, it, 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 a lot of the things I did were the result of all the things I didn't do because all the things I said no to left me with all this time that I said just now, you know. And with the time you have, even, even if you give any person twice the time that he had to do a design, will it be better or worse? So why is the West saying time is money? It's wrong. Take twice as much of the time, you'll come up with a product where you will use at least half the resources. And you might want to, you might like it enough that you don't need to d d take it down in a few years. So I realized that already by roaming around, my, my uh, time thus liberated helped me to pay attention closely to a lot of um, 
how humans interact with materials from the time materials are sourced. And I started comparing industrial with non-industrial ways of doing the same product, like making bricks. Making anything, for that matter. I have these lovely brick slides, so I'm showing bricks. But basically, when, the, when in a normal landscape bricks are made, then the, the different materials, they, uh, the brick, what makes this brick sustainable is the fact that the clay collected here after monsoon, the guys are using it, they have they are grown their uh, trees, they are using the thinnings to fire it, and when the brick kilns, are, uh, when the firing is done, the kiln will be dismantled like a Jenga installation, it will be back into a territory and next year it will be up again. So now what happens in the green rating systems, a brick is considered bad because it has XYZ kilojoules, okay? But not with what? Fuel? For them it's completely irrelevant if you used coal or you used coconut leaves or if you made thousand with your own clay or you went and made a huge monstrous quarry somewhere. So I want to talk about those things and um, you know the same goes for lime and there are entire communities whose expertise is going is displaced because architects who don't know about those things they will just pour, prescribe the Portland cement not because they consciously considered it but they just didn't know what else you could have done because it's for clay and for any of these materials you won't have a standard uh, it's not like a two minute maggie noodle you will know, have to know a little more like they won't tell you just do this you'll have to know a little more about the clay a little more so is it because we don't know that we are using the standard thing let's be honest over there i think we there's it's a lazy culture that is bringing this about and the cost uh, and we're losing rapidly all those things and when i started making my early structures with the uh, material on the spot whatever i have I, they, everybody told me all kinds of things that it's very expensive to do all that, but I found out a one project after project after project after project that it's all lies. It cannot be more expensive to eat the mango from your own tree than to export it to Germany after it was sprayed with pesticide and then eat it there, and then when I'll be sick there that I have an insurance. <laughs> so all this is nonsense. St stone, pro uh, stone extraction, if it is done in this scale, hand extracted, they are still hand extracting. And I realized that I could produce contemporary spaces by, by really putting these things in the center stage and, and create a sense of luxury where the people who have less money also find the same thing luxurious as the ones who have a lot of money instead of finding it very obnoxious, you know? So when you prioritize the craft, then all the humans relate to it. Because everybody, we have a common intelligence. And I think, so I started producing uh, architecture with all these things. And I've completely run out of time and I forgot to show my slides. So I'm gonna just show the slides now, okay? <laughs> Quickly. Uh, no, there are a few, mo two more minutes, I think, but okay. So these are, so I started realizing that you know, t um, I, I, when I moved to a rural area from uh, Bombay, I realized, I, I started noticing, first I used to think there's nothing here with what do you build, and I realized there's never nothing. If you open your eyes, there's, you see, don't look for a building material. What do we have abundance of? What is it? Lots of idle people, lots of clay, lots of pot, pots people are trying to sell. Um, they're losing their livelihood because of urbanization. So I thought, okay, whatever there is a lot of, how about diverting it into building material? So through that, I started producing, by the way, tile roofs that are more insulating, that require no support structure, no wood, no, you know. So using, taking time, using knowledge, uh, using only human resource, and, and amplifying uh, the impact of natural resource. So human resource is infinite, like my, my, uh, my, our intelligence, our muscles, our memory, our care, infinite. Natural resources are finite. Let's use what we have a lot of, and let's have, uh, use what we have less of, and upgrade the architecture too. So, I'm, yeah. so you know, I'm just going to show these images so you can you know, figure, see, even these units are made in the rice field, not in a factory, there's no overheads. Like those people who made bricks, made affordable bricks because they didn't have an eight-hour job. 
they also grow rice, they also do other hundreds of things. Now if I stop buying bricks from them and go to the main company, then the rice becomes expensive. I mean, let's look at all the how territorial impact. So through these methods, I actually started a lot of experimentation, got much more help from craftsmen than engineers. And because engineer said this is that is not possible because either it is their knowledge or it's the codes. But between those two things, we would not have been able to do anything. So we went to craftsmen and uh, they are always excited to make things and through their uh, own capacities, instead of using those cooking pots for cooking pots, I made ceilings where you require only 20% of the 30% of the steel because it's a lost form work system to make concrete efficient. So I have to skip all the things. These are pictures, that's my own house. This was my first hut made with round wood and my motorbike, Martin, for you. Um, so I used to live with a, in this kind of a hut uh, to be able to have an architecture practice and not to be a wage slave. The best is lower the cost of your own living and uh, liberate your own time. And so I would go with one solar panel. Why do you need so many lights? One long cable. It's only me in this room or that room, you know? Take the cable and put the light there, put it here. So I made, I just, set, my motto was reduced to the max. And I realized uh, by doing it, there were so many advantages that even when I had money, I didn't want to go back to using more things. I wanted just more time, more time, more time, you know, to live. And through that, we started, I started uh, building other projects like housing projects and co-housing projects where, you know, um, people uh, could, con you know, I liberated other people's time also. So that, you know, through sweat equity, you can have any, uh, have the way to get a bank loan. There's always something you can do in a building site. So I started s checking that the technologies will not alienate us for people from participating, you know? So I chose according to, I, um, I, I realized that the, the, the idea is to design the building process. You build knowledge and you build community while you build buildings. That's, that's the whole idea for me now. So these are some experiments with reducing cement by using ferro-cement, using meshes instead of big steel bars because, uh, you know, this is in the Venice Biennale, uh, one of the modular home systems I designed called Fulfill Homes, um, public toilets, etc. Testing, testing those materials with engineers in their labs and seeing what is the advantages of using less material. It will be m more better for the seismic, uh, you know, disaster relief, etc. Um, okay. This is Eric for you, my Louisiana exhibition but the same form you have worked on, uh, I have used this to be, make ferro-cement be cast on, for, on paper with all the Amazon cartons that are coming in. So waste materials are not only needed in the final. Architecture has a capacity to permanently absorb waste, but it has also the capacity to be a build, building process maker, you know, form work is a very expensive thing. And this is what I've been doing for shelter. This is a thin two, two and a half centimeter new version of using cement. Building with other things from the garbage, including books. I'm just showing some pictures because I want to keep time for other speakers. So using waste in building processes too, sometimes changing sizes of windows because you got a bicycle wheel, etc. Okay, and the other thing that was already spoken by the previous speaker, I believe in thinking with the hands and in education, giving students the opportunity to, to think one-to-one -one through four areas of direct confrontation, real scale, real materials, real people, and real places, you know? If you don't do this, you will create an alienation between academia and practice, and the student will graduate and say, what course do I do next? Because I feel I know even less. 
I feel in academia you should already build buildings with the support of your teachers. So these are all my students doing things. This is in Venice instead of terracotta. Okay, I'm going to end with this. This, pre this, uh, this is a project where I am um, contributing on a city level. There is a, it's called Auroville, uh, International City, Pedestrian City, designed by Roger Angers 50 years ago. And I've uh, recently been appointed um, head of urban design and continuing this legacy. I, all the projects you saw are located here, a barren land which was converted, um, you know, like this with people's decentralized action. But also the idea that a city does not need to deplete. It's when humans appear, we can, with our, the same time, you can create or destroy. You, c you can create your habitat. So th this, is, this is a project where I'm uh, working in a collaborative way on an urban design level for co-housing projects and this is what I'm trying to do. And I would like to end with this image here um, to, to make the point that I think the future will have to go from competition to collaboration. If we really want to be more effective and create excellence, um, I think that's what we'll have to be doing. And the challenge to all architects in the future is how to go vertical and how to be compact, but not create towers which have nothing to do with our, the thing around them, but create a new version of high density, which is not vertical, horizontal, where through new mobility, you will be able to connect, you know, the commons and the terraces and all of that and, and, and use that. In, um, in the Louisiana Museum, I was able to show, um, I think I have some image of this in much bigger scale blown up. And all these kind of projects, if you, instead of doing it solitary, even inside uh, our co-creation that takes place in a university, or I mean, sorry, in, a, in an office, the whole world at large can actually plug into projects. And if we open the doors like we did, students have also contributed to co-housing projects inside the urban design. Basically, anybody can contribute if only we let them. Thank you. <laughs>